What is gravity? You have no idea. Okay, next question. <laughs> what is gravity? You have no idea. Okay, next question. <laughs> Wow. No, here's the difference. We can describe gravity. Okay. We can say what it does to other things. We can we can measure it, predict with it. But when you start asking, like, what it is, I, I, I don't know. The flat Earth model, all of the heavenly bodies are orbiting the magnetic center of the known universe, which is fixed at our North Pole, the magnetic center. Since we live on a flat earth, a compass needle will always be attracted to the center of the world, not the top of the globe. This attraction to the center is apparent even when in the southern hemisphere. So the heavenly celestial bodies are orbiting us and we're stationary. This means there's some type of force causing these bodies to be weightless and orbit us. I think the ancient builders were probably aware of this principle and it explains how they were able to build structures such as the pyramids. If you're familiar with the Coral Castle down in Florida, a single man built a castle made of extremely heavy rocks very quickly and with almost no help or machinery. He never disclosed his method, but I suspect it had something to do with this magnetic energy that causes the moon and the sun to orbit us. Indeed, I believe that Nikola Tesla was aware of this force, and so he was able to invent free wireless energy and wireless communications, but more importantly, wireless energy, well before the internet was even close to being theorized. So even newfangled zero-point energy fields, which are being researched by very fringe scientists, seems to be akin to this electromagnetic force, which is causing the celestial bodies to orbit us. Who knows? Also, the relationship with the Earth and the Moon is demonstrably of the electromagnetic variety and certainly nothing like gravity would explain, without all the major coincidences, of course. So, if the Moon is orbiting us in response to an electromagnetic phenomena, it makes a lot of sense that one face of the Moon would be attracted to the face of our world, and that would perfectly explain that one face being ever-present. Furthermore, since the Moon is a lot closer in the Flat Earth model, it makes sense that its electromagnetic pull would affect the world's oceans. If you take a balloon and rub it against your hair, and then take that statically charged balloon near a tap, running tap of water, the water will bend. This proves that our tides could indeed be caused by the moon's electromagnetic field, or possibly a static electric charge, but not a gravity field. Indeed, if the moon were close enough to pull on our oceans with its measly gravity, the much greater Earth gravity should have pulled the moon into our world a long time ago. This proves the conventional model is totally wrong and not just unlikely. And it proves there's a logically sound, verifiable alternative to the conventional accepted model. At any rate, on the flat Earth, gravity is not necessary. Gravity was a theory dreamed up to explain why we're not flung from the surface of the Earth at a thousand miles per hour. Since our world is demonstrably not spinning, then we don't need gravity in our model. What goes up must come down is a law of physics. Gravity is a theory necessary only in the globe model. In the flat Earth model, what goes up must come down is explained sufficiently by the simple laws of density and buoyancy. Lighter, less dense objects find their way up, while heavier, denser objects find their way down. It's the natural order of things, and there's no need for gravity to explain it. If you take a beach ball filled with air, for example, and try to hold it underwater, you'll notice that it's difficult to hold it underwater, and it gets more and more difficult the deeper you get. When you let go of the ball, it will race to the surface of the water. So I suppose we should believe that the beach ball is somehow an anti-gravity device. It's beneath the water with all that pressure above it, plus all the gravity, you know, in quotes, gravity pushing down on it. The beach ball should remain underwater according to the theory of gravity. However, it invariably races to the top because it's simply acting in accordance with the natural laws of buoyancy or density. Same thing with a hot air balloon. It's about temperature, density. The North Star Polaris uh, is indeed a proof that the model is wrong and not just a crazy coincidence that needs to be explained in the globe model. You simply cannot argue the North Star could maintain such an alignment for any duration 
given our arbitrary, wobbly North Pole in your model. The North Star is simply at the very top of the celestial bodies orbiting above us and has the tightest path around the center. That's the only explanation for how it remains fixed in alignment with our North Pole forever or for any duration whatsoever. Now Einstein was once asked how it felt to be the smartest man alive. And Einstein's reply was, I don't know. You'll have to ask Nikola Tesla. So now I'm going to go over, talk to Nikola Tesla, and see what he has to say. He tells me today's scientists have substituted mathematics for experiments. And they wander off through equation after equation and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. I mean, how true could that statement be? Nikola Tesla is the true genius. He says Einstein's relativity work is a magnificent mathematical garb which fascinates, dazzles, and makes people blind to the underlying errors. The theory is like a beggar clothed in purple whom ignorant people take for a king. Its exponents are brilliant men, but they are metaphysicists rather than scientists. Oh well, thank you. Thank you, Tesla, for telling us how much bull can be found in Einstein's work, because you knew that way back then. So thank you for reassuring my belief system, right? So if gravity doesn't exist, then what's the force that pulls us down to the earth? Why do things fall down instead of up? And the answer is electromagnetism. Researcher and author Anthony Patch states, quote, In short, the accurate model of the mechanisms governing the functioning of our known universe is that of electromagnetism, not gravity. What is mistaken for and therefore labeled as gravity are in fact, and this has been thoroughly peer-reviewed, magnetic lines of force and the actions of accelerated charged particles moving at various velocities. Additionally, these same electromagnetic forces act in identical fashion, whether one is measuring actions taking place between particles at the quantum level or on a planetary scale. What has been detected by LIGO and other similar experiments preceding it are in fact magnetic lines of force and the movements and actions of accelerated charged particles, such as electrons and protons, among many others. As for black holes, supermassive, twin or otherwise, none have been experimentally reproduced in the laboratory. None have been measured in terms of electromagnetism. None have been moved from the chalkboards of theory to factual and provable constructs nor mechanisms. Many scientists will back me up on this statement. To define what are labeled as black holes, one must look beyond the again theoretical labels of dark matter and dark energy, neither of which have been proven to exist, and yet are considered as constructs of black holes. Looking beyond, one finds plasma, what Tesla labeled the ether, comprising the so-called vacuum of space. This ether is electrically charged plasma. Black holes are a gathering due to magnetic attraction of this electric plasma. This is not gravity, sucking in all matter and light as mainstream scientists describe black holes. Einstein's work, Gravity, was hijacked for profiteering. Tesla's work, The Ether, and Electric Universe, is the real science hidden away and employed at CERN. If you look at their mythematics of gravity, it says uh, that, you know, that the electro electrostatic force is 10 to the 37th stronger than the so-called gravitational force. And if you look at 10 with 37 zeros behind it, there's no human that can possibly even imagine what that looks like. I mean, it's beyond human comprehension. So, they, you know, these mythematicians love to throw around numbers like this, but they're essentially meaningless. But according to their own screwed up wrong mythematics, uh, es essentially gravity is, is non-existent with a 10 to the 37th difference. That alone. Uh, but this is the problem. This, this idea of gravitation, which was created by Newton, invented by him, has been extrapolated to the furthest reaches of the, of the solar system and the galaxies and all that. And it's created a huge list of non-existent entities, things like dark energy, dark matter, nuclear furnace stars, gravitational collapse for star formation, um, 
I could go on and on. There's dozens of theories based on this false concept of gravity. Black, uh, black hole. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. I forgot that one. I mean, all these things don't even exist, yet they're part of the mathematics created by Newton and extrapolated to the furthest reaches of the universe. So, I mean, this is the biggest uh, problem with, with academic science, is that it removed the creator from creation. How can you have a creation with a crea without a creator? There is universal mind behind all of this, and that is the impetus for all of it. Uh, like like most of their big projects, these huge megalithic projects are designed to be dead ends. They'll go nowhere. Nothing will ever come out of CERN. There's no such thing as a pig's bozo particle. This is all just 100% bull. Einstein was an idiot. He was wrong about everything. If anybody believes Einstein is correct, they need to watch Einstein's Idiots on uh, YouTube, the, the entire series by Bill Gatty. Then I would read his website, youstupidrelativist.com. And then I would go read the book called um, The Manufacture and Sale of St. Einstein, uh, which is 2,200 pages demolishing this myth called Einstein. It talks from the very beginning how they set up this shill called Einstein to be the great genius, the nutty professor, the quack, you know, the idiot with a massive blackboard full of equations that can, if he could just figure out that one last little part of an equation, you know, he'll have the key to the freaking universe. So, I mean, it's, it's disgusting. I mean, the, the level of science right now is really the pit of ignorance. What is gravity? You have no idea. Okay, next question. <laughs> this is how far we've sank in this demented uh, excuse for science. I mean, it's, it's, it's a joke, you know? I mean, we're living in a sea of energy. We're bathed in electricity. It's passing through us like crazy. Um, he was able to, you know, in, in Colorado Springs, he was able to develop this means of creating this resonant electrical lines of force, which you would be able to tap into with your home or your car or whatever. You'd be able to power it uh, wirelessly. And so he wanted, you know, Morgan and, and uh, these other guys that he was working with at the time to you know bring this technology to humanity and, and give everybody free energy but that was not allowed i mean they were too heavily invested in railroads and oil and coal and uh timber and all sorts of other stuff that they could burn up and blow up and stuff so uh they didn't want to go that route so we've basically you know the powers that be have definitely known what the true physics is since at least then they've known how to suppress this and keep this out of you know the public's view and keep us enslaved into this this hideous, uh, you know, explosion-based slave technology that's destroying the world. There are free energy already exists. The military is using this stuff. They keep it from us. And um, you know, my my goal was always to try to get as many people to understand that the so th so-called thing called free energy actually exists. And then we would get to a point where people would demand that the powers that be release this stuff to us. So we're, I mean, it can happen right now. I mean, it's not like it's something that's far off or whatever. The, the technology exists. The military's got it right now. But it's, it's existed since 1892 at least and probably further back. And it's obvious, you know, that there were cultures that had this. And this is nothing new, you know. If you look at the megalithic structures around the planet, there's no question that there was a higher tech civilization uh, about 13,000 years ago. They got wiped out. They were way, way, way beyond us. We can't do any of the stuff that they're doing. And the reason being is that they worked with nature and we're not. Because look at the beauty of their creations. I mean, have you seen all these megalithic structures around the planet? Now, instead of looking this as a circle, just think it as an infinite point of, uh, of uh, without uh, spatial volume. And if we look at it this way, we're, e we're more easily able to understand that. We think of this as an indivisible line that actually has no extension. We're talking about unmanifest inertia, or what uh, quantum uh, mechanics and general relativity and their insanity have called dark matter or quantum fluid, which is just nothing other than a euphemism for what Tesla, Heaviside, Steinmetz, Faraday, and all the greats of electrical theory that gave us 100% of our current electrical grid and system. Einstein gave us nothing of that. Nothing. Okay? He invented nothing. He discovered nothing. And um, 
His quote-unquote theory of relativity is mostly stolen from Henry Hanley Poincaré. Now, as you've seen underneath the ferrule cell, a magnet, doesn't matter what shape it is, looks exactly like this. It looks like a, a torus. Let me show it to you in a slightly uncompressed fashion. There you go. You actually see a torus, a toroid, a spirograph, a hypertrochoid. That's the expression of the loss of inertia. Now, as Faraday called magnetism, he called it the dielectric field. But what does that mean specifically? It means that the necessitated loss of inertia, i.e. the ether, must be expressed as the creation of space, and of course the posterior attribute of the creation of space is a measure of movements of magnitude, which we call time, but of course time does not exist. Time is a human contrivance. Now here we have electricity, which, by the way, is five times the IQ and Planck electrification. Electricity is nothing other than the hybrid of electricity and magnetism operating together, which is found in, obviously, frequency and amplitude, constantly pulsing back and forth like this. Well, what frequency? What amplitude? Obviously, we have the entire EM spectrum and we have electricity. So electricity is a hybrid of dielectricity and of magnetism, operating at a frequency and an amplitude. So electricity terminates not into magnetism, as wrongly thought, but as magnetism by losing its dielectric component. In other words, all that electricity that is actually brought through electromagnet to lift up dead cars so they could be scrapped is nothing other than the loss of the dielectric component of electricity, which means you have an extremely high Gauss field that is able to pick up multi multi-ton uh, cars with that electromagnet. It is that electricity terminates as magnetism by losing its dielectric component, not into magnetism, but as magnetism, because electricity is the hybrid of dielectricity and magnetism. Phi times psi equals cube, Planck, and electrification. Electricity, by definition, denotatively, is a combination of two things, dielectricity and magnetism. So by losing its dielectric component, the electricity manifests itself in the electromagnet, for example, as a huge, enormous, very powerful, high Gauss magnetic field. Gravity, like electricity, is nothing other than a hybrid. So what is gravity? Well, we talk about what denotes gravity. We're talking about mass i.e. matter. Matter is nothing more than a dielectric condensate. Okay, It's like taking carbon dioxide and freezing it to its solid state. Okay, Gravity is nothing other than dielectricity. Gravity is no different than turning on your TV set and actually shining a light off from the side and seeing the little dust particles actually head to the TV set and stick to the TV set. That's why you're shining your TV set, especially the little CRT tubes, got so dusty. The dust in the air would go gravitate to the front of the... That is the exact same thing as gravity. People think that that is an electrostatic charge, or like you charge a balloon up and you pull someone's hair to it. That same acceleration, not force, that same acceleration is what we ignorantly call gravity. Gravity itself is an autonomous acceleration, of which a lot of people call it in incorrectly a force, does not exist. It's like, what do you mean gravity doesn't exist? All of a sudden you drop this and there's gravity. What is gravity? You have no idea. Okay, next question. Gravity. What I mean specifically is that gravity does not exist. It is not an autonomous force. It's definitely not a force, which, of course, even the idiots of general relativity and quantum mechanics will admit to. They call it an acceleration. An acceleration of what? By what? We need explanations, not descriptions. And all that general relativity and quantum mechanics provides are descriptions, not explanations. It is a dielectric acceleration. It's dielectric avoidance. Okay, it is the loss of force in motion. 100% of the visible universe is this, is magnetism. Okay, the entire atomic structure of an atom in picometers, as it measured in picometers, is due to magnetism. So dielectricity, electrostatics, electricity, magnetism, and quote-unquote gravity are one thing only. It's our only pathetic human understanding of the nature of the universe that we think these are four separate things. Really, they're just one thing. Uncovering the missing secrets of magnetism. Here we have a standard CRT tube with a grid with a spiral projected onto it, which is being taken off of an old camcorder that's pointing at a wall with a grid on it with a, you can see, a clockwise spiral. So I have this camera, old camera, hooked into an old television set, taking a look at a clockwise spiral. Now let's take an enormous 
two inch by one inch N45 neodymium iron boron magnet. And let's show you centripetal and centrifugal vortex movements as we approach the CRT tube. Here we go with a magnet. Now, let's discuss this in a second, but first, let's look at what's at the center here. Can you see what's at the center? You see those scintillating hairs that are moving off in a clockwise direction? Okay, now let's flip the magnet the other direction and let's see what sort of spot we get on our CRT tube this way. Oh, surprise, surprise, look. We're getting counterclockwise movement. I don't know if you can see that very clearly. There we go. Take a look at that. Now, how do I know which polarity I have pointed here? Well, let's zoom out and take a look at our magnet. Now we have, of course, a clockwise pattern projected from the camera, from the camcorder to the television set. So let's see what this side of the magnet does to a clockwise spiral on the CRT. It moves it in the same direction. And look at the edge definition of where the black void is, because the, the black void is being caused by the centrifugal magnetic velocity. You can see the little spirals in the center of the white spot in the middle with the, you can see that uh, we're moving, our centrifugal field is moving uh, clockwise, but our centripetal field, which is at the middle of the magnet, is moving exactly opposite. It is moving counterclockwise. And we'll do a lot more CRT demonstrations showing quote-unquote repulsion and quote-unquote attraction of magnets against the CRT tube, which is emitting uh, dielectric uh, lines of uh, force that are contacting the phosphorus on the inside of the tube. That is why the magnet is uh, such a great demonstrator against the CRT tube. And uh, this is the first example you've ever seen of someone proving beyond any shadow of a doubt using a CRT tube that the centrifugal on a magnet, meaning the outside rim edge of the magnet, is moving absolutely opposite to the center of the magnet, the centripetal returning. And I used it using a geometric projection from the camcorder off of a grid paper on the wall. And let's actually turn these magnets end on. Oh my God, look at that. It looks like a single magnet, but this is actually two. In other words, when you look at either pole like that, it looks exactly the same thing underneath the ferro cell as it does with one magnet. Oh, how shocking. That would be a proof of a platonic incommensurability. But this is the exact same thing the report in their own video is seeing. You actually see a vortex of binary objects rotating around a point, a null point of a maximum acceleration and inertia. Is this any proof of Einstein's uh, gravity waves? No, it's simplex electromagnetic theory. It's very, very simplex electromagnetic theory. This doesn't prove Einstein at all. It actually, all it does is it reinforces Tesla, reinforces James Clerk Maxwell. You see, Einstein didn't invent a damn thing. And what little ideas he did have, he stole from Hanway Poincaré and others. There's actually many books out there about that. This is just classical electromagnetic field theory that explains the observations of Tesla and Maxwell. I mean, <laughs> these idiots spent millions and millions of dollars and they want millions of more funding, which is why they, they made a huge press announcement. Because they want more money for more funding, because that will, you know, pad their jobs for the next 20 years. And they're going to be looking for something that has already been explained 80 years ago by classical electromagnetic theory. Well, my God, let's reinvent the wheel and ask for a bunch of money for it. So today's huge scientific announcement was nothing other than a pile of crap by a bunch of brainless scientists with more money and more gear than brains looking for plenty of funding to keep their asses in work. Oh, my God, what a timeless story of stupidity and ignorance. Deception.